on the vestibular bulk biogenic potentials. I hope everyone can see and hear me uh, yeah. yes, yes. clearly. Yeah. So um, I will start talking about um, vestibular bulk myogenic potentials, which is an evolved potential specific or looking specifically at the vestibular system, the vestibular pathway. So um, this slide is mostly for the benefits of those who are participating and are, are not in the ENT field. Uh, for example, neurology, physical medicine, and other specialties. So the vestibular system is responsible for the sensation of balance. The end organs or receptors of the vestibular system are located in the inner ear. And we have two types, the semicircular canals, which are responsible for angular acceleration, and the otolith organs, which are the, which are the end organs which are important with regards to the vestibular about marginal potentials that I will be discussing, the sacral and the utricle, which are both involved with detecting linear acceleration. So, if you are familiar with evoked potentials in general, uh, the idea behind the evoked potentials, for example, brainstem auditory evoked potentials or visually evoked potentials, is that you need a stimulus that is reproducible, short rise time, and comfortable for the patient. In the past, what, what, what was used to stimulate the vestibular system was natural stimulation. In other words, stimuli that the vestibular system is used to detecting. So in this case, we are uh, talking about head acceleration. So the initial attempts to record the potentials involved various forms of head acceleration, such as placing a patient in a rotating chair or while the patient was in a horizontal position to allow the head to suddenly drop. But of course, as you can understand from this description, this, uh, this form of stimulation was very difficult to reproduce, involved complex mechanics, and of course was something that was not very comfortable for the patient um, to experience. But since the 1990s and um, beyond that, it has become clear that one can use sound stimulation similar to, the, to what we use in brainstem or determinable potentials with some minor um, changes in the uh, parameters if one can do that, where one can use sound stimulation very simply to stimulate the vestibular hair cells in the inner ear, send the vestibular potential down the vestibular nerve and record vestibular system function. Again, this is a non-invasive method of recording function. One can still use headphones or ear inserts as one would use for brainstem or to potentials. There are other forms of stimulation as well, such as vibrating the skull either on the forehead or on the mastoid, or even electrical stimulation across the mastoid. But the emphasis of this talk will be on air-conducted sound, something that is familiar with most people, especially if you are already doing brainstem auditory development potentials. So how is it possible for sound stimulation to stimulate a system that is responsible for detecting head acceleration? Well, it has to do with where the end organs are with respect to the oval window here. So as you will already be familiar with, we have air conducted sound vibrating the tympanic membrane, sending sound waves or sound stimulation along the middle ear ossicles and vibrating the oval window here. Now normally when sound passes from solid to the liquid perilymph, the sound waves immediately move laterally. That is, so the fact that we have the cochlea to one side is not a coincidence or an accident or a coincidence or an accident. The reason the cochlea is connected is located to one side of the oval window is because this is where the sound waves will deflect. However, and therefore, because of this 
immediate deflection, if you like, this is the correct physical term to use, of sound waves moving laterally, the vestibular end organs with normal sound, 60, 70 decibels, with average sound intensity, will not normally stimulate the vestibular end organs. And that is why with sound stimulation that we normally hear in the environment, we don't immediately get dizzy. But if one uses the correct sound, the correct intensity of sound stimulation, before the sound waves move laterally, they will move forward. And this will allow membrane fluctuations of the otolith organs, the creation of sound waves in the endolymph of the vestibular end organs, the movement of the hair cells in the vestibular system, and the creation of other potentials that will be sent down the vestibular nerve, either the superior or the inferior vestibular nerve. So the reason that we can use sound stimulation is to use the right sound, the right power in the sound waves that will allow it to move forward before moving laterally and thereby allowing the vestibular end organs to be stimulated as well. So in summary, the best way to stimulate the vestibular system is moderate intensity sound of uh, 90 decibels above average human average human threshold um, when using the uh, terminology of the brain stem multiple potentials or 120 decibels peak sound pressure level you can use this sound intensity if you have the ability to stimulate at specific frequencies on your system now i'd like to say at this point that yes there are indeed specific dedicated evoked potential systems on the market that are designed for you to record vestibular evoked myogenic potential. However, as I mentioned in all the lectures that I attend and I give, and I'm invited to uh, talk at, that if, for example, you have a brainstem auditory evoked potential in your laboratory, you can do vestibular evoked myogenic potentials as well. So if you do have a BIOP system in your laboratory, you, don't, you do not need to buy, necessarily need to buy a separate VEP system if you do not have the economic means to do so. You can do this on your brainstem or your developed potential system. And I will try to explain this during this talk as well. So this sound intensity, 90 decibels above average hearing threshold, is enough if you have a 500 hertz tone. If you only have click stimulation on your, on your system, this of course refers to those who have BIOP systems already in the laboratory, and you do not have tone stimulation because there are systems that do not allow you to do tone stimulation, you have to go a little bit higher intensity, 110 decibels. Lower than that is not enough to stimulate the vestibular system at the required power to get the response. So this is the sound stimulation in summary, and I will repeat this later on. And with regards to ENT specialty or neurotology, one of the uh, useful uh, applications of using vestibular above margin potentials, not only to look at the otolith system, because of course we do have a way of stimulating the superior semicircular canals with the caloric test, and the video head impulse test that we now have at our disposal. But for the oscillate stimulation, with regards to vestibular above myogenic potentials, the usefulness, and the usefulness of this examination, which I will try to convey to you as easily as possible, is that we have a separate form of stimulating the oscillate organs in addition to the semicircular canals. But we also have the ability to look at the superior and inferior vestibular nerves separately. And this is important when we want to rule out not only a superior vestibular neuritis, but an inferior vestibular neuritis as well. And to the neurology field, the usefulness of vestibular above myogenic potentials is that also allows us another angle to look at brainstem function because the vestibular pathway um, enters and passes through the brainstem, uh, not only in a caudal 
a fashion towards the spinal cord, but also upwards towards the midbrain as well. So using vestibular velmagenic potentials, especially in the neurology field, we can also look at brainstem function as well. So we have two main types of vestibular velmagenic potentials. The first uh, example that I will speak about now was the first that was discovered at around 1990 by James Colbatch in Australia um, and his team. Cervical vestibular vert myogenic potentials are recorded from the tonically active stenochidomastoid muscle. And as I said earlier, and I emphasize this again, this is all surface recording, so there is nothing invasive about using vestibular vote myogenic potential. So we're recording from the stenochidomastoid muscle. It's an easy muscle to find, especially if you ask the patient to flex the, the neck, either from a, a sitting city position or while the patient is lying down, to ask the patient to lift their head up from the pillow. So it's easy to see the stenochidomastoid muscle on most occasions. And we record from the same stenochidomastoid muscle on the same side as the ear being stimulated. And with regards to the cervical vestibular vote margin potential, we are specifically recording from, mainly from, it's not 100% as has been discovered um, recently, in recent uh, publications, but mainly from the sacral, the inferior vestibular nerve, and going into the brainstem, we can record from the vestibular nuclear complex, the medial vestibular spinal tract, going down towards the spinal cord direction, the motor nucleus of the mastoid muscle and the spinal accessory nerve. And we need the stenocleidomastoid muscle to be contracting at the same time. And the response is mainly an inhibitory one. So the setup is simple. We only need three electrodes. We record first on one side and then on the other. Avoid recording both sides at the same time. The reason that you need to avoid doing that is that there is also a contralateral response, which will get in the real right way, of, way of your responses. And also avoid do it recording both types of, of vestibular vertebral potentials at the same time, but I will discuss that and we'll go into that later as well. So, with regards to the setup of cervical vestibular vertebral potentials, the active electrode, uh, the more important electrode what we record the main response from, is placed on over the middle of the stenocleidomastoid muscle. So you find the stenocleidomastoid muscle um, with regards to how we do the examination our laboratory. Our habit is to have the patient lying down on the bed, on the bed, which for us and also with regards to the literature is the best way to record the VEBS if you have room in your laboratory to do so. Because asking the patient to contract by lifting the head up from the pillow produces larger responses than asking the patient to turn the head towards the opposite side. So from a lying down position, you ask the patient to lift the head up a little bit from the pillow and palpate the student for the mastoid muscle. You find the middle, or if you prefer, there are some laboratories that do prefer finding the upper one third. But the middle or the upper one third, it doesn't matter where you record as long as you are consistent between your patients and your normal controls. So as, you, as long as you do it for everyone, it's okay. The reference electrode is placed on the clavicle, on the middle of the clavicle usually. And the ground electrode is placed either on the forehead or on the sternum. It doesn't matter where as long as it's near the head. So this is an example of a uh, cervical vestibular valve margin potential that you see on the top here. Of course, I am showing you the best response, but I'll go into this later on. So, so you, have, you see here the, the stenocleidomastoid muscle contracting. So like I said, to record the response, response you need the stenocleidomastoid muscle to contract. Why do you need the stenocleidomastoid muscle to contract? Because when the signal from the sound stimulation reaches the muscle, it will very transiently, for a short period of time, inhibit the response. So this is an inhibition of EMG activity. 
Remember that I'm talking, when I say EMG, do not con confuse this with needed EMG of neurology. When I say EMG, I mean recording muscle activity. But in this case, we are using surface electrodes to record the muscle contraction occurring under the electrode. So, there, there is a transient inhibition of muscle activity around 13 milliseconds after stimulus onset. Sometimes it's, it's easy to see, especially in young people, as in this case. Sometimes it can be difficult to see, especially in muscular people who have very strong contractions or people with short neck. But in those latter cases, the trick here is to record more than one response and superimpose the two together. Or three, if you like, but two is usually sufficient. So even if you have a lot of muscle contraction occurring in the background, you will see a reproducible inhibition of muscle contraction after 30 milliseconds after stimulus onset. And you record the latency of this inhibition, this positivity here, uh, well, this positivity is, with, uh, I am showing here the graph where positivity is down and negativity is up. So you need to check how your system uh, presents your waveforms. So you record the P13, you put the initial positivity after 30 milliseconds, and there is a following negativity after 23 milliseconds after that. And you measure the amplitude from P13 to N23 as well. Now at this point, I need to emphasize the importance of controlling for muscle contraction. I won't say this is a disadvantage of the examination as such, but this is something that you need to keep in mind. And the reason I emphasize this here is that there are lots of publications, especially even in uh, well-recognized journals that ignore this fact that when you have more contraction of the stenocleidomastoid muscle, the amplitude of the CVEM increases. So the more the contraction, the more the CVEM. So if you allow your patient to contract the way they want and not the way you want, the amplitudes of all your normal controls, for example, will be all over the place and you will not have a low enough standard deviation. So you can say, this is where normality stops, and this is where pathology stops. You will have too much overlap. So you need to control somehow for muscle contraction. I do not want, do not, do not want to take the time here to describe the many methods that you can do that um, to avoid swamping the lecture. You can ask me on this later on at question time or after the lecture, I will give you my email at the end so that if you have any questions with regards to your specific system, you can send me an email and I'll be happy to help you. But the way we do it, and for us, this is the best way of recording, uh, for controlling for EMG contraction, is to record the, action, the EMG This is all surface recording, and the EMG I am showing you here is the EMG recorded with exactly the same electrodes that you are using for recording the CBAP. The only difference here for this graph here is that there is no standard deviation. This is recorded using a separate program on our system. More specifically, I am using a sensory nerve conduction study. The reason I am using a sensory nerve conduction study to record the EMG here is because we are in the microvolt range. Motor nerve conduction studies are in the millivolt range, so you will not be able to record this using motor nerve conduction study program. You need to use a sensory nerve conduction study program. And the, the other reason that I'm using a sensory nerve conduction study is the ability to do rectification. Now, this is a large, fancy word that you will find in many MEMP publications. What this simply means, well, the 
why we have the need to do EM rectification. And I'll explain to you what this, very, this term means, because this is a, a very simple phenomenon, is that when you record EMG, EMG consists of positive and negative phases. So if you average the EMG as it is, the result will be zero. And you cannot divide zero into an absolute C value, which you will need to do at the end. So what EMG rectification simply means is that you take your EMG or any waveform that has positive and negative phases and makes it either all positive or all negative. So all your values are above zero. So when you take the average of this signal, you will have a definite value to divide into your c amplitude. So going back to this, and, and I'm sure, I hope it will become clear to you when I say to you that when you have a larger EMG amplitude, in other words, larger contraction, you will have a larger c response. But this is for the same patient, large EMG, larger c -VEMP. But if you divide the c amplitude by your EM, rectified EMG amplitude, the value will remain constant for that same person. So the amplitude of the EMG increases, the amplitude of the CVAMP increases, but the ratio of CVAMP amplitude to EMG will remain constant. And because for that same person it will remain constant, for all your normal controls, you will have a value that is not variable, you will have a definite standard deviation, you'll be able to determine upper and lower limits, and you'll be able to use your corrected, as they say in the literature, CVM amplitude to separate normal controls from patients or abnormal results, if you like. If you have any questions with regards to this more specifically, you can ask me at the end. So these are the parameters for those who have brainstem auditory valve potentials. You can change the parameters such that you can do vestibular evoked myogenic potentials. You do not need to take this down. As I said earlier, I will give you my email at the end of the talk. If you need a PDF file, not only of this slide, but of the whole presentation, I can send it to you. I have, I'll be very happy to do so. So at the end of the talk, I will show you, I will give you my email address and I can send you the presentation, no, no problem, together with the parameters as well. So you, you do need to change the frequency, the sweep, the gain if you can. I don't want to go into this um, at this, uh, in this talk so as not to confuse you, but if you have the ability to change the gain of your software, that will produce larger amplitude response for you. If you don't, or if this is confusing, it doesn't matter. You can keep your BIOS program as it is and just change your frequency uh, bandwidth. And with regards to cervical vestibular valve management potentials, we did produce international guidelines for this, which is now considered an international guideline by the International Federation of Clinical Physiology. It was published in 2014, so you can find this in the publication as well, where we describe in detail where we try to make an effort so that all the laboratories of the world do VEMPs in the same way so everything can be comparable. And at this stage, I would like to talk about the second type of ocular vestibular vault margin potentials, the ocular vestibular vault margin potentials, which was discovered later on. I believe it was 2010, 2005, at the behest of Sally Rosengren, um, who, uh, who is also in Australia as well. If I remember, if I remember, last time I checked, she was there, although she was uh, circling the globe at um, various times, God bless her. So the OVAMP, in contrast to the CVAMP, instead of recording from the stenocleidomastoid muscle, you record from the inferior oblique muscle. And with regards to the ear stimulated, you record from the inferior oblique on the opposite eye. Again, I emphasize here that this is all surface recording. There are no needles involved. So again, this is all surface recording. 
So, ocular vestibular valve management, managing potentials. Again, you need tonic contraction. Instead of asking the patient to flex their neck, this, in this, uh, in the ocular vestibular valve management potential, you need to ask the patient to look upwards. Now, if I could be uh, um, allowed to go back two steps and go into more detail with regards to the cervical vestibular valve margin potential, if I may go back a few slides, sorry. With regards to contraction, like I said, in our laboratory, we ask the patient to lie down on the, on the bed in a horizontal position. The best position for the patient to be in, if you have the ability to do this, is to lift the headrest a little bit. So the patient is not completely lying down, but the headrest is up slightly, which allows, which, um, and this is easy for the patient to lift the head up. And so they're lifting the head up from a completely horizontal position. It's easier for the patient to lift the head up when the head is slightly raised. You will have, you will read in the literature, a description of 30 degrees above the horizontal, 30, 25, it doesn't matter. You don't need to take a protractor and place it against the bed and measure exactly 30 degrees. The important thing is to have the head rest slightly up. So the patient is comfortable, but again, not in a horizontal position. Now you will see many references in the literature about having difficulties recalled CVEMS, for example, in the elderly. I can tell you this from now, in my personal experience, I do not have any problems at all recording in the elderly. You will see references in the literature about avoiding recording VEMPs in patients over 60 years of age. The trick here is, and this, is, this has to do with the way you're recording EMG. You only need minimum contraction. When I ask the patient to lift their head up from the pillow, my instruction is this. Lift your head up from the pillow such that you just about do not feel the pillow below your head. You do not need more than that. The reason you do not need more than that in this case is that you are recording EMG. So even though you're recording a small amount of EMG and you may get a smaller amplitude CVEM if your patient was not contracting at maximum, because you are recording ratio, it doesn't matter that the CVEM amplitude is going to be low. You will get the, the ratio that you want. The reason I emphasize this as well at this stage is that you do have out there dedicated VEMP systems that ask you to contract the muscle at a minimum of say 50 microvolts. And you may have a gauge on the monitor on the VEMP system where it starts off red, and once it goes green, then the system starts recording. The problem there with such dedicated systems, unfortunately, is that not many patients are able to reach 50 microvolts the minimum that your system requires. Uh, this, this is true for the elderly. I can tell you from, from now that in my patients, most of my patients will contract to 10, 20 microvolts, and you will get good VAMP responses. So if you do have a dedicated VAMP system, there are some systems that allow you to avoid this minimum EMG declaration that it requires you to do and that allows you to record the actual EMG. I recommend you to do that. And if you, this, and this will allow you to record VAMPs in elderly patients because I can tell you from now, most of your elderly patients will not be able to contract at 50 microvolts. 20 years, 25, but not 50. And this is probably why most of the literature avoid recording at the elderly, not because the elderly patients do not have VEMPs, they, have, they do not have the ability to reach this minimum EMG. So, going back to the ocular VEMPs, which are, as I said, you're allowed, you need to record this from below the opposite eye. 
And instead of asking the patient to, lift, to contract this synecodermastoid muscle and have them lift their head up from a horizontal position, you ask the patient to look up as much as they can. The reason that you need to ask the patient to look up, look up is that it brings the inferior oblique forward closer to the recording electrode that you will place below the eye. And I will describe this in detail very soon. So um, this brings, so you ask the patient to look up as much as they can. It's best to have a mark above them. So if you have the patient in a lying down position, like we have, you have the mark on the wall behind them. If you have the patient sitting down, you have the mark up on the ceiling. But you need to place the mark such that they need to look up as much as they can. And, this di and, the, and the o vamps differ from the c vamps I described earlier with regards to where it records from. So instead of from the utricle, this time we are recording mainly from the utricle. So with o vamps we are recording mainly utricular function. And instead of the inferior vestibular nerve, we are recording now from the superior vestibular nerve. So a different pathway, not the inferior, but the superior vestibular nerve. And this is important, especially when we want to rule out different forms of vestibular neuritis. Again, we have the vestibular nuclear complex, but in this case, instead of going down in the brainstem towards the spinal cord, we are now moving up towards the midbrain. So the medial and tunic fasciculus, ocular motor nucleus, third cranial nerve, and the inferior oblique muscle. And instead of being an inhibitory response, this is now an excitatory one. So the setup again is simple. Three electrodes again, including the ground, either on the forehead or on the sternum again. It doesn't matter where the ground electrode is, as long as it's near the head somewhere. The active electrodes with regards to the opposite eye is you find the orbital ridge of the eyeball. So below the eyeball, we have the orbit in which the eyeball sits. You find the bone as it moves around in. So the orbital ridge, the midpoint, and you place your active electrode on that point where the bone ends before you find the eye. The midpoint is the best place, especially with regards to the elderly. Um, if we have time, I can go into the reason as to why that is, but the, choose the midpoint. The reference electrode is below that. You will see many references in the literature about having the reference electrode two centimeters below, 1.5 centimeters below. It doesn't matter. You don't need to take a tape to measure exactly where the reference is. You just need to have it close to the active electrode and not touching it. So there isn't a shorting of the responses between the two electrodes. It's important here that, that to emphasize this montage, you will see many references in the literature on different forms of montages, even bizarre montages about recording not only OVMs and CVMs as, as well. To keep things global, homogenous, standardized. The, the montages I am describing here with regards to the OVEMS and the CVEMS is the montage that you should be using. This is agreed upon, if not by 90% of the international uh, community, 95%. So the majority use this montage. Please just use this montage and do not use another montage that your uh, company providing the system tells you to do. Please insist on this. This is the best montage to record your responses. So this is an excitatory response. So instead of an, an initial positivity, you will have an initial negativity. And this response is from the inferior oblique muscle. So you record amplitude. The literature usually says from the negativity here, to the positivity here. Can you record from baseline to N1? No one has said you can't, but the majority of the literature measure, the, measure this amplitude as well. These other, you will get other peaks as well. These other peaks also 
comes from the inferior oblique muscle. On many occasions, this second peak is larger than the first. Be careful of this. You need to make sure that you're recording the right peak and, and, instead of, and not this peak that may lead you to the conclusion that you are obtaining a delayed response. It can happen to the best of us. Sometimes you will discover that the response is here because when you do the other eye, it's better. And when you superimpose the left and the right eye, you will, come to, you will see the, the first response and you will say, oh yeah, this was the response. It's just that it wasn't clear when you did the first eye. So you, you will get this on occasion, but you do need to make sure that you are recording this response and not the second response, which can sometimes be larger. Now you may say to yourself, well, if it is larger on most occasions, why aren't you recording this response, um, this second response here, instead of this first response? Good question. The reason we are, we are not doing that up to now is that no one has investigated this yet. So um, someone just needs to come along and prove beyond reasonable doubt that recording this response is as good as this. Okay. But if we want to go use the literature and the way the literature agrees on the way we do this, we need to record from this first response. Do you need to record EMG? The literature says no, you, you can record the amplitude as it is. I had some um, um, talks with uh, colleagues, um, not only on Facebook, um, but over emails as well, and they have already shown that recording EMG does not provide a significant advantage over recording um, the response as it is. But like I said, no one has investigated this or published this yet. So, to summarize with regards to Vemus methodology, and we will go into the clinical applications in the following slides. So, sound stimulation, either tone or clicks, depending on what your system that you all may already have provides for you. Tone is better because this allows you to lose, use a lower stimulus intensity. In other words, it's easier for your patient. But if you only have clicks, you can use clicks. 90 decibels above average hearing threshold if you have tone, or 100 to 110 decibels if you have clicks. You need to average at over, uh, over 100 to 150 stimulations. The rate of stimulation of, uh, pro of, of providing the stimulus is five hertz. So five sound stimulations every second. And you are recording from the tonically active muscle. So the muscle needs to be contracting at the same time. The ipsilateral stenocleidomastoid muscle or the CVAMPS, which uh, records mainly circular function. And from the contralateral inferior oblique muscle or OVAMPS, if you, if you, to record mainly utricular function. So, we will go into the clinical applications now. I prefer to give you actual examples from our laboratory as to how this is useful. I avoid giving a list of uh, applications that one may find in the, in the literature. And there are many examples. This is, um, I won't say tip of the iceberg, but this covers the majority of cases that you will find, that you'll, you'll find in your clinic although there are other applications as well. And for these other rarer applications, you may have to take one case at a time. Uh, but in the majority of cases, what you may find in the, um, predominantly is, and I will describe for you this uh, very soon in the, in the following slides, is when you have a case of Menius disease, vestibular migraine, and does your patient have either one or the other, or perhaps even both? There are many references in the literature with regards to superior semicircular canal deficits, which I will describe later on. I don't know what your experience with this disorder, but as far as uh, our laboratory, our neurophysiology laboratory um, goes, well, we are, I, I'm, I'm working in the neurology institute, although we do get referrals um, from ENT colleagues as well. I've only seen three cases up to now in the past three years. So it's at least rarer than seeing a Menias disease or a questionable Menias disease case. 
It can be useful, though, to look at specific oxidative dysfunction, and I have a case of that as well. And also, if you have a rare case of vestibular neuritis, but the eye movements do not match a superior vestibular neuritis, and you want to confirm that you are in fact dealing with an inferior vestibular neuritis and not a central nervous system dysfunction. So, so the first case I describe as a uh, neurological application. But the reason I call this a neurological application is because this was referred to us from uh, my neurolog neurology colleagues. This patient was followed at our institute with epilepsy, 41 year old female with epilepsy. And she came to our, um, to our laboratory after experiencing vertigo and imbalance for two weeks. She was negative for positional nystagmus. She was taking valproic acid for her epilepsy and stimulated to control her vertigo symptoms. And the question here was to rule out vestibular migraine. And I'll explain what, and the reason I did, um, they suspected vestibular migraine was because the pure tone audiogram was normal. And as you know, meningitis disease is characterized usually by a loss in low frequency uh, with regards to pure tone audiometry. But this person, patient, had a normal audiogram. So the patient was sent to, sent to us to rule out a vestibular migraine. But on direct questioning by myself to the patient, it was already clear to me that the patient did not have vestibular migraine before doing the event, simply because the patient did not mention any episodes of having migraine at all. Not only with regards to not having the headache related phenomena with regards to migraine, but other associated symptoms with regards to migraine, such as sensitivity to light, sensitivity to sound, the need to be in a dark room for a while, nothing like that. So already from the symptoms, it did not appear that the patient had vestibular migraine. Now this is for the benefit of those who are not directly in the ENT field. Very briefly, we have um, several types of conditions that come to our mind when a patient presents to us with spontaneous episodic vertigo episodes that last from for hours to very few days. So Menis disease um, is characterized not only by uh, spontaneous vertigo, but there is also unilateral fluctuating sensory neural hearing loss, usually unilateral, tinnitus, and a feeling of fullness in the ear. Usually associated with the accumulation of endolymph in the cochlear duct, but this is usually found on histopathological um, examination. So not all cases of Menia's disease are associated with endolymphatic eye drops, although please forgive me when I use this term to describe this general category of patients where they may be, <coughs> sorry, endolymphatic eye drops or the cause of the uh, person's symptoms that may result at some point with the lymphatic eye drops. But when I say endolymphatic eye drops, this is to avoid the quotation marks. And in fact, whether there is a buildup of endolymph cannot be determined in the clinical setting, pre-mortem. So, vestibular migraine also is characterized by episodic vertigo. Um, Definitely the minimum here is migraine episodes or um, symptoms associated with migraine, such as sensitivity to light or sound, not necessarily with the vertical vestibular migraine. What is the single most important symptom that you are experiencing? It has to be vertigo. It has to be vertigo to eventually be diagnosed with vestibular migraine. There may be migraine episodes separately, but the key symptom has to be the vertigo, together with the uh, migraine episodes. The difficulty sometimes with differentiating between the two disorders is that, for example, that even though tinnitus is characterized or is associated with Menis disease, there are some vestibular migraine patients that can complain of tinnitus. And even though migraine is 
is associated with vestibular migraine. There are some many disease patients, disease for other vestibular disorders, can present with migraine. And if that is not difficult enough, there are sometimes patients that can have both Meniere's disease and vestibular migraine. So, how can one differentiate between the two with regards to vestibular but myogenic potentials? I, as I mentioned earlier, the best stimulus to use with regards to vestibular but myogenic potentials, not only with CVAM but with OVAMS as well, is 500 hertz. But in, when, in cases of endolipatic high drops, you can have a shift of best response from 500 hertz to one kilohertz. This is described in the literature as frequency tuning. And especially if you combine this, if you can, if you can with caloric testing, if you have an asymmetry in your caloric response, the shift from a, the best response from 500 hertz to one kilohertz is characteristic of the presence of endolymphatic high drops. So when you have a case or a question mark on your uh, referral letter as to whether the patient has Meniere's disease or does not have Meniere's disease or the patient has vestibular migraine or not, you should do your VEMPs, either the CVEMPs or your OVEMPs at two frequencies, not only at 500 hertz, but you should do a separate study at one kilohertz. So as I show here, in this case, the pure tone audiogram was within normal limits. And that's why, this is why the referring doctor suspected vestibular migraine, because there was no indication of low frequency hearing loss that you would normally see in many diseases. Now, with this slide I show here, this is using only 500 hertz. This is a normal study. The reason I am showing this slide here is to emphasize the importance of controlling for EMG contraction or monitoring for EMG contraction somehow. Like I said, let me know what your system has and I can best describe to you how you can best do this in your laboratory. But with our method, by monitoring surface EMG recording, what you will see here is the top is the C band response for the left ear and for the right ear. You see here that for the left ear, the amplitude is larger on the left than when you stimulate on the right. And you will see this in the literature on many occasions. This is not an abnormal response. This is a normal response. The reason you have a larger uh, response with regards to the left ear is because the amplitude, the EMG, the contraction in the mastoid muscle on the left was larger. The EMG is larger on the left than on the right. That is why you have a larger response. If you take the ratio on the left, dividing the rectified EMG amplitude into the CVM, and you do it separately on each side, the ratio is similar. This is not an abnormal response. This is not an asymmetry response. This is a normal response proven by the fact that you have monitored the EMG at the same time. Well, if not at the same time, at least in parallel somehow. In, on our system, or on, 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 on our system, we don't have the ability to record rectified EMG on the same screen as a CVAM. So I go back and forth between our BIOP software to the sensory nerve conduction study program. I do 50 stimulations here, 50 stimulations here, go back to 50 more, and then continue with the EVEM. So I do a um, interdigitation, if you like, of the responses. So at least with our setup, the EMG recording represents, in general, the contraction obtained when, when, when obtained the CVEM. So this is our method and it works okay. So like I said, frequency tuning or frequency shift is when you have a better response at, at one kilohertz compared to 500 hertz, which represents or is um, suggests the presence of endolymphatic hydrops, and you know what I mean by that up to now. So this is the same patient here. 
And this is the response from the right ear. And um, we are recording the CVAMP at 500 hertz, at one kilohertz. Take my word for it, the EMG contraction is similar at both frequencies. But as you can see here, the response at one kilohertz is larger than at 500 hertz. Larger than uh, what you would expect at least the 500 hertz. Uh, you may get it sometimes to be at the same amplitude, so, but to be, to be larger, you do not expect this to occur in a patient or in a person who is uh, physiologically normal. So this larger response at one kilohertz compared to 500 hertz is suggestive of the presence of endolymphatic hydros. But the audiogram here is normal. So why am I insisting on the presence of Menier's disease? And this, you'll find this in the literature, and this is coming out recently, that you can have a form of endolymphatic hydrops that does not involve the cochlea, hence the normal audiogram, involves the vestibular labyrinth. So a separate form of endolymphatic hydrops involving the vestibular labyrinth, not involving the cochlea. And this has to be described in the literature, in those papers that have described it as recurrent peripheral vestibulopathy or endolymphatic hydrops involving the vestibular labyrinth only. And this is very, very important if you have patients with normal audiograms, but the clinical picture says to you, gives you the feeling that this is Menier's disease. Why is my audiogram normal? Yes, you do have endolymphatic hydrops, but not involved in the cochlea. Uh, we have recommended in this patient uh, and, uh, to do calorics as well, because in, usually in these cases of uh, recurrent vest peripheral vestibulopathy or endolymphatic hydrops involved in the vestibular labyrinth only, you will have a a caloric abnormalities as well towards the, the abnormal ear. And here is another interesting case. Um, a 56-year-old female with probable Menier's disease. No doubt about it, she does have Menier's disease. I can tell you that from now. The pure tone audiogram was reported by the patient. I did not see the audiogram myself. She didn't bring it along with her, but she tells me that it showed low frequency hearing loss on the left ear. I did the VEMP with the frequency tuning protocol, but instead of showing frequency tuning for the left ear, this is one kilohertz and 500 hertz where the amplitudes are similar. When looking at the other ear where the audiogram was normal, I saw a larger response at one kilohertz compared to 500 hertz. Uh, something I've not seen in the literature yet, although I do have a colleague, and I don't know if she's watching now, where she has seen a similar case herself. And we plan to put these two cases together and publish it at some point, hopefully very soon. This phenomenon, if you've seen it yourself, uh, especially if you do do VEMS, where the audiogram is abnormal on one ear, and yet the frequency tuning is seen on the other ear. In other words, endolymphatic hydrops, if you like, involving the cochlea mainly in one ear, and the vestibular labyrinth in the other ear. Why is this important? It may be important if you are, if you have in your laboratory or in the clinic, the protocol of introducing enterotympanic steroid injections to as part of the, your management protocol, you may, then the question arises here in a case such as this, where would you do the intratympanic steroid injection? In the ear with the abnormal um, pure tone audiogram, or would you do it in the other ear where you have the frequency tuning or the vent? Or putting it in a different manner, would you prefer to manage the hearing loss first, or would you prefer to manage the episodic vertical episodes? Good question. I will not attempt to answer this here 100% because this is something that hasn't been published yet. But hopefully, we'll have this published soon, um, especially as a 
group study. And um, two more cases, and then I'll end my presentation. Um, this is um, describing the possibility of a central cause of vestibular dysfunction. And this is a very interesting case that you may have come across in your clinic, um, and you'll find this in the literature as well. So note here what I emphasize on this slide. An 84-year-old lady. Other laboratories would say, no, this patient is 84 years old. I'm not doing a VAMP, sorry. I will show you here that yes, indeed, you can do a VAMP in this case. So an 84-year-old lady with long-standing feeling of non-specific vague distance, dizziness over many decades. She, she, uh, she had air caloric stun, which built diminished responses bilaterally. So she had abnormal bilateral color responses. The, the referral asked the question, well, the, the, what was written in the referral letter, rule out a bilateral vestibulopathy. This was from an ENT colleague, and he expressed to me that he did not believe, or this was not compatible, this did not sound like a bilateral vestibulopathy case, even though the, uh, the responses came back with a bilateral caloric dysfunction. These VEMP responses are normal. I have, I have better responses to show than this, but because of the, the crisis with COVID-19, I'm giving this at home. I have better cases in my office, and I forgot to bring this home, so I can show you this. But clearly you can see here a reproducible response, a CVEMP on the left, a CVEMP on the right, an OVEMP on the left, and the OVEMP on the right in an 84-year-old lady. So, many, much, much contraction in the background, but clearly a reproducible response. And I can tell you here, I have a case in my office, which I unfortunately could not show you here, a clear response in a 76-year-old with VEMP amplitude, C-VEMP amplitude of 100 microvolts. I am not kidding you here. You can get huge responses, especially in this 84-year-old produced normal and C-VEMP responses. Caloric responses, as you know, are responsible for specifically recording from horizontal semicircular canal function, superior vestibular nerve function before it enters the brainstem. But the OVEMPs, which are also responsible for recording from superior vestibular nerve, are normal. So clearly we have here selected dysfunction. And you will find here, when this has been reported as well before, of reports of patients with, together with the parametric examinations presenting to you what apparently looks like selective horizontal canal dysfunction. And I'm sure you've seen this before on many occasions, and you will see many references in the literature with regards to keeping in mind the fact that you may have isolated um, blood circulation dysfunction involving the vestibular labyrinth. And these sorts of cases can present um, in, in such a way. There are other reports as well that we should not forget about, especially with regards to how the vestibular nuclear complex was constructed. And you can have selective lesions of the vestibular nuclear complex in the brainstem that can give such selective findings on your parametric examination. So in this paper published uh, a few years ago by uh, the group of Michael Komagi and his group, where they bring forward the argument of the possibility of selective brainstem dysfunction when you have paramedical evidence of selective, for example, horizontal canal dysfunction, normal calorics, abnormal calorics with normal OVEMPs. But do not forget the fact that you may have selective blood circulation abnormalities in the vestibular labyrinth that could give you the same findings as well. And but there are also reports of cerebellar lesions that can give you such findings, and also uh, reports of vernic encephalopathy with thiamine deficiency can also give you such findings as well. Uh, one I would like to discuss very briefly 
uh, with regards to a superior semicircular canal deficit case I did see. Unfortunately, again, because of the COVID-19 case, I do not have the specific um, um, uh, uh, waveforms here. I did not have access to the CT, unfortunately. As soon as I had performed the VEMP case, uh, the patients went abroad. Uh, but this was a case of a patient who immediately after diving to deep breath, uh, depths of the ocean and coming up immediately afterwards, he presented with long-standing chronic vertigo symptoms. And when I did the VEMP, I obtained huge VEMP responses, not only with the C-VEMP, but the O-VEMP responses. For example, the C-VEMP, I remember, was obtained at amplitudes of 86 to 90 microvolts, but the EMG rectified amplitudes were 10 microvolts. So this was a young person. Again, I emphasize the fact that not, not all people will achieve the minimum EMG uh, um, uh, threshold needed by some dedicated VEMP system. This was a young person. He did not contract the EMG, his stomach and mastoid muscle, beyond 10 microvolts, but he could have huge CVAMP responses. The ratio of his responses, the CVAMP to the EMG is around 10. Our upper limit of value with regards to this ratio is four. Each laboratory has its own um, uh, uh, normal values. Ours is four. This patient had 10, and he had huge VEMP responses bilaterally. But unfortunately, I didn't have access to the CT. I hope to have that later on. So these are with regards to the cases I would like to present uh, with regards to this uh, talk. Um, I show you my email here in the final slide. Um, like I said, um, you can send me your questions. You can send me what you have specifically in your laboratory and what you have and I can help you with what you have to uh, record VEMP responses. We can also take things case by case. So you have a, uh, if you have a specific case and you would like to ask me, is my, will my VEMP be useful in the case that I have in front of you? I can help you with that as well. And also, if you want a PDF file of this slide with the parameters, send me your email on this email that I'm showing you. I can send you a PDF file of the whole presentation. I have no problem. I can send you the whole slide. I'll be very happy to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor, for your extensive elaborative talk on WEMP. And uh, your cases, case presentation was very, uh, very good. Uh, I hope the participants have learned uh, to differentiate the various uh, uh, vertigo symptoms like uh, vestibular migraine and uh, many STCs and in, um, and, yeah, similar presentations. Sir, we have two queries, sir. Uh, during the uh, when you when you perform the test, why is the why is that the 500 hertz is particularly used? Any specific advantage? Well, the, uh, the reference to the literature with regards to 500 hertz and why 500 hertz is best, it's simply, if you agree with me, but this is the, the literature, what the literature refers to, physics, simple physics. Perhaps the way the endolymph circulates, the perilymph circulates, how much the, the membrane of the otolith organs, how much that is distended, the location of the otolith organs with reference to the stapes foot plate and the oval window. Basically, the structure of the inner ear and how sound waves propagate through this medium, through this liquid medium, this membranous medium. Maybe the way the hair cells orientate themselves within the endolymph and how stiff the hair cells are within the endolymph. Based on this, this is what most, if not all, people agree with. Simple physics of the inner ear environment may be that which explains why 500 hertz is better. And the fact that one kilohertz is better sometimes 
with regards to endolymphatic hydrops is perhaps because of the buildup in pressure, because of the buildup in endolymph in the inner ear, maybe that the difficulty of the vestibular hair cells to move with respect to sound stimulation makes it such that it will not move as easily at 500 hertz and it will move better at one kilohertz because of this increased pressure environment with regards to endolymphatic eye drops. But that is the feeling that everyone has up to now. Thank you, sir. Yeah, uh, I have one question. Can I? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, I'm Dr. Somnijit Das. Uh, I want to know, is there any electrode pre preference for getting optimum response? Uh, can can, um, can this be repeated? Because uh, yeah, the audio is there, very, uh, uh, Is there uh, any preference over any particular type of electrodes to get a very good response? Do you prefer any specific type of electrodes to get a better response? So if you're talking about the type of electrodes, if I've, if I've heard this correctly, surface electrodes that one uses for evoked potentials and one uses for EEG. Now I'd like to back up a little bit. If you have these electrodes, yes, you can use the the normal EA, EEG electrodes, the surface electrodes that one uses in clinical neurophysiology. Now, recently, I have the habit of using the EKG electrodes that we use for recording electrodes, and I cut some, some, uh, across most of the, um, the circle so it becomes horizontal, and I use that to stick on, because we are talking about skin, one can use stick-ons. So um, if you do not have dedicated stick-on EEG electrodes, um, I personally use the, the EKG electrodes and I, I cut them a little bit on either side so they're not, because if you, have, if you put the EKG electrode below the eye, the circle is too big. So I cut the EKG electrode across so that it becomes, becomes like horizontal and I place it below the eye and across like this. So for me personally, recently I've been using the, the stick-on electrodes that we use for EKG recording. If you do not have those, um, then using the surface electrodes that one normally uses for evoke potentials or EEG, those are okay as well. Uh, uh, can I ask one more question, sir? Is there any study depicting sudden sensory neural hearing loss on presentation of 90 decibel stimulus in normal hearing ears? If it affects the vestibular vote myogenic potential? Yeah, yeah. It does not. Okay. Sensory neural hearing loss is cochlear function. Vestibular vote myogenic potentials is mainly secular or mainly utricular function. It has nothing to do, or at least nothing to do directly with the cochlea. So you can record normal, good sensory neural, good VEMP responses, either CVEMP or OREMP, in patients with complete sensory neural hearing loss. And this was one of the ways initially with CVEMP around 1990s, where it was proven that VEMPs are vestibular in origin. By recording VEMP responses in patients with complete sensory neural hearing loss, the fact that you could obtain VEMP responses was proof that VEMPs are vestibular in origin and not cochlear origin. I have another question. Uh, many times when the patients come, they already have taken vestibular sedatives. So how long would you wait before going on to do a VAM? Uh, can you repeat the question, sorry? Yeah, M many times uh, patients with uh, dizziness and all, they take vestibular sedatives before they come to the physician. So how long would you ideally wait uh, to get the VAM done for those who have already taken vestibular sedatives? Um, are you talking about the time that we wait between doing a CVAM and the OVAM? No, no, no. The vestibular sedatives, anyone who has taken vestibular sedative drug like stematil and all, how long would you wait to get the VAMP done? Or does, let me put it in another way, does the vestibular sedative affect the VAMP recordings in any way? Uh, 
if a patient has uh, vestibular neuritis, um, if I understand the correction, um, the, uh, um, the, the question correctly, if a patient yes. still has vestibular neuritis and has no, no, my question. Cured, Sorry, sir. It's actually uh, someone who has taken stemetil and all vestibular sedative drugs. Does it affect the BAMP recording in any way? If vestibular neuritis affects, affects the BAMP recording? Vestibul vestibular uh, sedative drugs. Uh, like can I ask? Uh, in, uh, yes, you if you can ask, yes. Yeah, so what, what he was asking is, some patients do take uh, some sedatives, like vestibular sedative drugs. So uh, when they take the drug and come to you, how long do you wait to uh, perform the test? Who would say that I was like with the other, like with the other drug examinations? Yeah. So does, does the vestibular sedative drugs uh, affect the uh, WEMP recording? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Yes, they so do. How long do you wait? Uh, I mean, how long do you uh, keep an interval between uh, the drug? You ask the patient to, to stop taking the sedative for 48 hours, two what? days. Yeah. So I hope uh, Dr. Samyajit does that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, doctor, yes, sir. Uh, all the participants, if you have any queries, you can unmute yourself and directly speak to Professor. Uh, sir, good evening. Um, uh, uh, sir, can I ask a question, please? Yes, yes. Uh, if you had any uh, tumors involving the yeah, vestibular nerves. Would it show up on them? I have, I do not have a personal experience yet with coming across a patient with a cerebellar pointing angle, um, but um, yes, uh, the literature does say in the, those um, senses who have experience with these sorts of cases that you can, for example, have an abnormality in the VEM response and not in the brainstem or the potential. So depending on the morphology of the cerebellum pointing and angle tumor, you can have involvement of the VEM if the tumor is affecting either the superior or the, or the inferior vestibular nerve. So um, with regards to using VEMs in these cases, clearly, and the literature does agree on this point, that, um, the MRI, of course, um, supersedes vivo potentials. What's important in this case is if you need vivo potentials in your health system to prove that there is an abnormality before a patient is approved to do MRI. Or um, it's important to have this at your disposal, especially if uh, you do not have, if your center does not have the possibility or easy access to perform MRI. But in answer to your question, can a VEMP be abnormal in cases of cerebral pointing angle tumor? The answer is yes. Thank you, sir. Some, uh, sometimes we come across patients um, who have uh, sensory neural hearing losses associated with vertigo and the MRI is uh, negative. Um, it's uh, essentially normal. Uh, it's a pretty tricky situation, whereas the tone decay is, very, um, is uh, abnormal and other investigations are abnormal, but the MRI is still uh, normal. So I was wondering. Uh, with regards to um, sensory neural hearing loss, we have a normal, normal MRI, um, it, we're talking about um, cases of um, idiopathic sensory neural hearing loss. If you, um, uh, if you agree with me, what well, we have is spontaneous um, sensory neural hearing loss cases um, where you can or where, where you may or may not have vertigo associated with it, although there, are, there is in the literature that in the absence of vertigo symptoms, the prognosis for these idiopathic on sudden onset sensory and neural hearing loss is usually good. If you remember, if you agree with me. 
uh, where to see the patient uh, response in the long run. So for the time being, uh, he's doing his own steroids. And of course, the, uh, the, the steroid management as soon as possible after symptom onset. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I think. Uh, Hello. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, thank you for the very nice presentation. Myself, Abhishek Ruiya. Sir, I just want to ask you have you experienced any patient who developed sudden sensory neurone hearing loss after he has been giving such a high, high stimulus of 90 decibels? With regards to the VAMP, uh, 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 with regard to uh, with regard to VAMP, uh, like for 90 decibels stimulus is giving. So, has he developed any sudden hearing loss? Love, did you no. face yes, any uh, this no. kind of patient? Yeah, the answer is no. With regards to the um, the sound intensity or the concern with the sound intensity. In fact, James Colbatch published a short, if not a short, uh, paper. It was an editorial about uh, I think 10 years ago, I think it was General Clinical Physiology, where only James Colbatch would do this because with regards to physics, there is no match in uh, this guy with, um, with anyone else, where he went into the physics of sound stimulation and whether you are using air conductive sound or low conductive vibration, with clearly, uh, with regards to these sorts of sound intensity levels, an important factor, of course, is the duration, how long you give the sound. Now, because we are giving the sound for only a few minutes, and I can tell you now with regards to our application, where we give 50 stimulations at a time, we allow the patient two minutes to rest, and then we continue. Now, this two minute rest period that we have after, uh, with regards to the, the vestibular stimulation, is more to do with the muscle contraction rather than to the sound itself. So, so the patient doesn't get tired too much, especially with regards to the stenocardiomastoid muscle. We contract 50 stimulations at a time, which is about not even a minute. So, uh, one minute at most at a time with these. I want to say high intensity levels, especially when we're talking about tone stimulation or 90 decibels. Yes, clicks, you need to go to 110 decibels. It's, it's, it's less than the maximum of your evoked potential system, if that's a, a system that you have. The cutoff or the block on your evoked potential system is 120 decibels, usually above average from the threshold. Your system will not allow you to go above 120. But you can use 110 for the VEM. But because you are only doing this for less than a minute, for a few seconds at a time, it is safe. Um, I can tell you from my personal experience that I've been um, involved with VEMs um, since at least um, uh, 2005, if not earlier than that. And I've, I have not had a single case where a person has come back and said to me, I have hearing loss from the study that you gave me. That, that was never a factor. Uh, Abhishek, I hope that answers your question. Sir, I think uh, we have end, uh, we are at the end of uh, the question session. Uh, I hope uh, all, your, all the queries have been answered. As Professor has posted his email ID in the screen, if anyone uh, requests wants a presentation, you can mail it directly to the, to the professor, and I think he would be happy to send it to you. Very happy, very happy. Uh, thank you, Professor, uh, for accepting our re request and doing us a webinar on VMP. Uh, I hope uh, most participants have benefited with this short talk, and uh, we hope to see you again soon, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much.